During your response to her heckling of you, you used the word illegal when talking about the man who allegedly killed um, uh, Lake and Riley. An undocumented person. And I shouldn't have used illegal. I should have, it's undocumented. And look, when I spoke about the difference between Trump and me, one of the things I talked about on the border was that his the way he talks about vermin, the way he talks about these people polluting the blood. I talked about what I'm not going to do, what I won't do. I'm not going to treat any 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 of these people with disrespect. Look, they built the country. The reason our economy is growing. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Just a catch of strays over here. <laughs> You're in for a hell of a show. Keep the faith. Hold the line and own the lids. It's time for our main Welcome back to the Ruthless Variety program. I am Michael Duncan. Joining me today, comfortably smug, in a new friend of the program, longtime friend of the program, but a special guest nonetheless, Matt Whitlock. Thanks for having me, guys. It is a real honor. Longtime listener, uh, as you said, friend of the program, and uh, excited to, to join you guys on this journey. We've got a lot of crazy topics. So yeah, I'm well, excited. Very important substitution today at the last minute because uh, well, know, Holmes couldn't make it, and yeah. it hasn't been working out with Ashbrook. So <laughs> <laughs> that is fake news. Uh, our, our other friends, unfortunately, have um, you know reasons they can't be here today. They're with us in spirit, of course. But we're going to have a fantastic show uh, for you. Before we get into that, Whitlock, uh, just for our listeners' sake. Uh, who are you? Yeah, I uh, actually got to know a lot of these guys through working with Senate, Senate candidates, Senate races over the years. Now I advise uh, on the outside a lot of candidates, companies, elected officials uh, in a number of different ways, particularly on social media. Um, but yeah, I met most of the, the group here when I was at the NRSC in the crazy 2020 cycle, which yeah. was a lot of fun. And before that, I was in the Senate for a long time with uh, Orrin Hatch and before that, Mike Lee. Um, and so great Great group here, and hopefully I, uh, I don't bring the program down too much. Oh, no, pal. <laughs> That's not possible. Um, so let's get right into what we saw here at the top of the program, uh, which is basically Biden doing cleanup for the comment that he made at the State of the Union that, how dare he say, uh, that the person who murdered Lake and Riley was an illegal. What are our thoughts on that, folks? I mean, he is spending more time apologizing to a murderer and telling everyone to have respect for a murderer than acknowledging that his policies have allowed illegal aliens. They're illegal aliens, folks. Don't let him say migrant because that's the term they want to say because it sounds nice and they don't have to admit. When he says things like, these are the people who built our country, that's the whole thing is they want to obscure the fact that every illegal alien is a criminal. By definition, they broke the law when you illegally entered our country, the same way that if someone illegally enters any country, they're breaking the law, they're criminal. Furthermore, this criminal in particular murdered somebody, and the U.S. president's top priority yeah. is to apologize to if, them. If, if we can't call this person an illegal, come on. <laughs> that, and that, that point that he made was so silly sounding when he says, I don't want to treat any of these people disrespectfully. Well, I think we'd be okay with you treating a murderer disrespectfully. <laughs> you yeah. can disrespect a murderer. He beat a woman to death just for the, the crime of going for a jog near her college campus. But I think the other thing here that's really important is this highlights a dynamic that has chased Biden his entire presidency where he is always focused on the wrong thing. Mm. Inflation was going up. They passed tax credits for electric vehicles. There was the wildfires in Maui. Joe Biden, you know, goes off to Lake Tahoe. Afghanistan right. falls. Kamala Harris shoots videos with the child actors talking about space. They're never yeah. focused on yeah. the right stuff. And in this case, he is more focused on making sure the murderer feels okay and welcome in our country by not calling him an illegal than he is about the fact that that illegal committed a brutal murder. And yeah. I also think it's crazy to look at the number of Democrats that came out and made that point. Mm -hmm. They came out and said, I'm very upset that he, you know, referred to this person as an illegal. And I just think it highlights that disconnect between Democrats in 2024 and normal people yep. who want to see the president angry about an illegal immigrant coming into our country and murdering somebody for no reason at all. I, I, the one thing I think we can all say is at least 
they didn't browbeat him for not referring to the murder as Latinx. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, so yeah. That, I mean, that's where we are. I mean, it, yep. it's unbelievable that all this time and energy is being spent by the president of the United States because Democrats all got on Twitter. They're like, no person is illegal. Right. They are going after him for calling a murderer an illegal. They're not going after him for letting in a murderer. I mean, this is, it's like, am I insane here? That, like, what is happening that we've reached a point where the problem here is calling a murder an illegal, not that he entered the country because of Joe Biden and he murdered a woman. Well, and it also goes back to, do you guys remember in the 2020 primary when Democrats had all those hand-raising questions? Yeah. And yeah. one of the questions they all raised their hands for was, would you decriminalize illegal immigration? And I think the overarching point here that's so important is, Democrats don't want to treat illegal immigration as a crime. Correct. They That's want it. to legalize illegal crossing. That's Essentially, right. it's it's larger than just opening the border. They want to make it legal for illegal immigrants to come here as they're waiting to be processed, if there even is going to be a process. And I think that's the overarching fear here is they want this to be simpler and easier for people. And it's a part of that cultural push they're doing of just kind of trying to shove the Overton window along. That's it. That's why they call them migrants. Again, don't say the term migrant. Don't let them use the term migrant. That's all part of their process of trying to shift this from what it is. It's a crime. They're an illegal alien because they committed a crime entering this country. And every illegal alien is a criminal. They want to call them migrants so you forget Right. That a crimes occurred. It's also a convenient way for them to do this magic trick where they refocus the debate about nomenclature yep. rather yeah. than rather than a murder, yep. right? Yep. yep. And uh, here from Axios, this is uh, the title: Biden's illegal fallout. Progressive anger with President Biden for referring to the alleged killer of Georgia nursing student Lake and Riley as quote an illegal is threatening to overshadow what was otherwise a widely celebrated State of the Union speech. Yeah, there's celebrations. <laughs> Biden told MSNBC he regrets using the phrase, triggering furious attacks from Republicans who say it illustrates how tone-deaf Democrats are when it comes to immigration. Yeah. I think that it was very interesting how he handled Marjorie and the pin and the say-her-name thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was a moment where it seemed like he was going to do something nimble, and pull out the pin and say the name, and, but he got the name wrong. Yeah. You know, if you're going to engage in this, if you're going to take the bait, you've got to get it right. And I think he really made it worse for himself by getting the name wrong and then by apologizing to the killer. And at the same time as he was on MSNBC apologizing to the killer, having President Trump actually meeting Lake and Riley's family, where Lake and Riley's family was blasting President Biden for getting her name wrong, that juxtaposition was brutal yep. for President Biden. And yep. I think it really showed Biden has always gotten this brand as being Mr. Empathy. None of us know where that came from, you mm -hmm. know, because he, he's gotten that. But these last three years, every time there's a moment for empathy where it's, you know, troops who are being brought back to the United States in caskets and he keeps looking at his watch, yeah. whatever it might be, I think... We've just seen time and again him fumble the ball at opportunities to show empathy. And I think Lake and Riley at State of the Union was another one of those. He yeah. might have had his heart kind of in the right place, but he totally fumbled it because he was more worried about pleasing Democrats in the room and yep. getting them to clap than he was about actually having a moment. Yeah, it turns out he's not the uniter in chief that he said he was when 100%. he ran in 2020. Americans for Prosperity has done it again. You're going to love this. Know how Biden's been running around the country bragging about Bidenomics? And the media's doing stories on how the president has embraced the term? Well, guess what? Americans for Prosperity just bought the Bidenomics.com domain name. I can't believe the White House didn't get this first. This would be like Pepsi buying Coca-Cola.com. It's hilarious. Bidenomics.com sets the record straight on the failures of Joe Biden's economy, his horrible record on cost of living, wages, debt, deficits, energy and more. I've been to the site. I can tell you, it's not what Joe Biden wants Americans to see. AFP takes Biden's own words and compares them to the reality of everyday Americans. It's packed with facts and stories that prove Bidenomics is a costly failure. Americans for Prosperity deserves a lot, a lot of credit for this coup. Visit Bidenomics.com soon, the website Joe Biden doesn't want you to see. That's not the only thing that came out of the State of the Union, though. Another story here from Axios headline is Biden's big plans wield new budget to stay on offense post State of the Union. 
Uh, President Biden will use his budget proposal for fiscal year 2025 to double down on tax increases for wealthy Americans, large corporations, blah, 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 blah. All of this, as we know, as people who've worked in politics for a long time, is basically a messaging tool for Biden to run here for re-election. So none of this comes as a surprise. Um, but what do we take of, of what we saw in the State of the Union, how he was trying to basically pick a fight with Republicans mm -hmm. here on things like taxes and all of that? How is that, that going to pan out as far as an election message? So for, for me, first off, and, and this couldn't be clear, is he's trying to run on the standard like, oh, the rich need to pay their fair share. The person who needs to pay the fair share is Biden's family, <laughs> his son, right. his daughter. Both are pinched for not paying their taxes. I mean, how is this guy able to get up there with a straight face, try to tell the American people, hey, you folks watching this, you're not paying your fair share. He just needs to go home and find the people who aren't paying their fair share. <laughs> He's got tax cheats under his roof. Yeah. That State of the Union, to me, felt like it was hyper-focused at the very far left of his base that he knows has been angry with him, has been frustrated with him. And all of these policies, the language, he's using Bernie and Elizabeth Warren language because he knows their constituencies are the ones that are the most upset with him right now. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the, of course, pro-Hamas segment. And so that State of the Union felt incredibly focused on that far left segment. And I thought what was so interesting is when you watch Biden's staff that night, they had that CNN flash poll mm -hmm. that said a majority of people thought it was good. So they touted that far and wide. They also did a Navigator's Research poll that said people liked it. Now, Navigator's Research, we know, is funded by far left dark money, mm. all the way back to, of course, our friend Hans Jörg Wies, who you bring up all the time. They use foreign dark money mm -hmm. to pull and promote their messages and then try and cement those narratives to the world. What we found out particularly about that CNN poll by the next morning was it was the worst received State of the Union message in 25 years. Mm -hmm. But by that point, the narrative was set. Look at Axios just, I think it was today or yesterday, they're already writing comeback kids stories yeah. about Joe mm -hmm. Biden and it's based on false information. It's based on a view of polling that doesn't take any historical context. If it's the worst received speech in 25 years, probably not something you want to double down on. But they're going to double down on the positive narrative that they created by promoting the speech and the polling about it that was one from liberal dark money or two from CNN that didn't take any historical context. So we're going to see them double down on something we know only appealed to a really narrow segment of well, it, That's the thing is there's also a self-selection process yep. here to watch in the State of the Union. It, the, the, the president's supporters, by and large, make up the majority of people who actually tune into yep. the State of the Union. So when they conduct these polls, as you're sort of alluding to here, they're always a very yes. rosy sample for the president of the United States. Every State of the Union is received well. By those watchers, yeah. They're received well <laughs> by the watchers. That's just how it works. We know this because, you know, we've worked in this for a long time. But, like, even in that uh, context, mm -hmm. Joe Biden's speech was poorly received, yep. you know, relative to other speeches, whether that's Donald Trump or George W. Bush or Barack Obama. I mean, I think actually Biden has two, now two, of the worst received mm -hmm. State of the Union's in recent memory from Absolutely. that CNN poll. Yep. Um, another thing, because Whitlock, you know a lot about these liberal uh, dark money groups. And I thought what was really interesting about the State of the Union was how Biden in the last you know 15 minutes of the speech managed to cram in every like liberal advocacy <laughs> groups, yep. you know, pet project, whether it's the PRO Act or any of these sort of other things. Do you guys find that interesting? Because oh, I thought it was hilarious. It's amazing. Well, and, and those of you who know how a State of the Union historically has been created know that there's sort of a cattle call from the entire administration mm -hmm. to get priorities into it. And then it's a fight with between the president, the speech writers, and the sort of domestic policy staff to figure out what actually makes it in, what gets left on the cutting room floor. So as you're saying, those last 10 or 15 minutes, it was basically like, you know, a wish list, check the box, sort of mad libs of every liberal dark money priority. If you were to go through those last 15 minutes, the number of specific bills and issues you could find that had either been heavily advocated for or written by some liberal dark money group, particularly mm. in the Arabella Advisors nexus, right. you would be able to identify the 
follow the money for all of those. And I think that's such an important point to point out is Biden's not going to leave those people hanging. Right. He's nope. expecting them to spend probably upwards of $2 billion. We know in the last few cycles it's been over a billion dollars, and I think this time it'll be even more, trying to get left-wing policies and candidates through their elections. And so, you know, those shout outs to their pet policies are the way that he is paying back the liberal dark money groups that got him and his, you know, uh, Senate majority and current House minority into office. And yeah. so that's how that, you know, that's how that works. Yeah, we, we did a, a live stream of the State of the Union here in our fantastic uh, studio last Thursday. And like, first of all, shout out to all the minions and everybody impressive. who watched. Yeah. It was awesome. We even got like some super chats, like you know, like we're we're not like uh, very good influencers. We don't know how this game really works, you know. But like people were donating five bucks, ten bucks into the chat. It was it was awesome. I I I'd never seen anything well, like you that. You got to fight before. that Biden inflation. It's incredible. But the, I I felt like the feedback was great. The listeners were great. The engagement was great. Smug, did you have a good time? Yeah, I mean, I think that was the only way, honestly, to enjoy the State of the Union because like. If you did not have essentially a bunch of friends to hang out with yeah. and make fun of Biden, I'd be pulling my hair out. Like yeah. the guy says Lincoln Riley. Like, yep. yeah. And this is our president? Like, <laughs> it, I'd be depressed if I wasn't having a great time. I love that Lincoln Riley trended and the actual Lincoln Riley's photo was all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> People were pointing to, you know, I hope Lincoln Riley out there is okay somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Someone do a wellness check on yeah. Lincoln Riley. Yeah. Um, it's, it's sad that it is a joke, but it is. It is. Know, it's the only way to get through some of this stuff. Oh, that's what our show's all Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Coming up on Ruthless, a TikTok flip flop. Some prominent Republicans are now defending TikTok. Very interesting. Uh, we got chaos in Haiti. You're not going to want to miss that segment. There's some wild, wild stuff happening yeah. in Haiti. And we got some incredible variety. We got a little bit of a, a little kerfluffle on uh, the royal family's uh, Photoshop fail. Uh, you're not going to want to miss that. Uh, we'll be right back. Okay, we got to get to this TikTok story. Um, it's very interesting, and I think, I, I, I hope us here in this room can help suss it out for the listeners because it gets a little bit complicated. But uh, this story here from Axios, inside Trump's TikTok flip-flop, former President Trump stunned Republican China hawks this week when he appeared to argue against banning TikTok, the juggernaut video app owned by Beijing-based ByteDance and beloved by young Americans. The backdrop here, folks, is there's a bill working its way through Congress right now to basically force, you know, TikTok to sell um, uh, or ByteDance to sell TikTok, basically to divest itself from the CCP and this chi the Chinese holding company and all that sort of stuff. And it went through the House, and I think it just got out of committee like 50 to zero. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, and, and it is extremely, extremely rare for something to get out of committee with no opposition from either party. Well, and what I think is really also important to note there in some of the Capitol Hill reporting was that before that vote, this committee had a very rare classified briefing where they went through the specific threats and how this is being used against teenagers, minors, young people in America yeah. for <clears throat> Beijing's purposes. And so the fact that they got two hours of classified national security information and then held this vote and it was 50 to nothing tells a pretty good amount. So, so I want to get to that mm -hmm. part because this is a very important thing, Whitlock, mm -hmm. is uh, I've heard this from multiple people on the Hill that um, they, they showed people what TikTok did. And you've talked about it, Smug. Yeah. Uh, what TikTok did after October 7th in Israel mm -hmm. with with juicing the algorithm around pro Hamas content. Yep. And from what I understand that that was sort of like that was the straw that broke the camel's back for people mm -hmm. on Capitol Hill to see like what a danger this app is to be exposing American minors to basically propaganda for, from Hamas and the CCP. That's the thing is so. I, I think every American at this point, whether they want to admit it or not, can recognize the fact that China is in control of the algorithm, and there's nothing that they enjoy more than division and chaos in America. Mm -hmm. We saw during the riots of 2020, TikTok was pushing all the content they could to young people saying that, hey, uh, you and your family engage in white supremacy. You have to get out there. You have to riot. You yeah. have to do something right now. They see how easily they can just press some levers and get instant results 
of the youth in this country. When that bill was being uh, considered on Capitol Hill, the app itself presented to all the young folks in America, press this button and it will place a call to your member of Congress. Yeah. Tell them you need TikTok. And reporters were saying, OK, we have now listened to recordings that are being left for members of Congress where the kid says they will kill themselves if TikTok is banned. The kid says that right. they will show up and attack the Capitol. Yeah, like you just TikTok you is... just proved the point. That's the exactly. exact point. It's like TikTok got together and said, what can we do to prove everyone's biggest fears about the capabilities of our app in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party correctly? And I think that it honestly is one of the worst sort of public affairs campaign strategies I've ever seen in my life. Because what, one thing that I also read was that when kids opened the app and it said, call your member, it said, you can't scroll or use the app until you've placed that call. Unreal. So there were offices getting calls from kids saying, are you my member of Congress? Who are you? I don't know. TikTok just made me you know, put this call through. And so to me, it just one, shows how shallow this entire effort was, but two, really highlights how horrifying it is to have this kind of power in the hands of one of our adversaries. And the other thing that I think is so important here is knowing what this bill really is. They're calling it a ban because TikTok knows that's the way to rile up right. their support against it. They know from a public relations perspective, calling it a ban is the way to rally people. But what we also know is it's not a ban. Nope. It just simply forces ByteDance to divest from TikTok to another seller. Now, if this was a normal social media app, I think it would be able to sell just like how Elon bought Twitter. Obviously not the simplest thing in the world, but it can be done, you know, through simple financial processes. Yeah, I mean, right. Elon got the, the, the keys handed over to him in like 24 hours. Exactly. So it's not like this is rocket science. And further, when, when President Trump was in office and this first go at, at having TikTok uh, be divested from the Chinese Communist Party was happening, the, the proposal was have Microsoft yep. uh, get ownership of it. And it's like, okay, great. You're going to have like a company that makes office software now in charge of the algorithm. So we know it's not going to be right, like, yeah. here, let's push Chinese propaganda. I mean, that's pretty simple. I think a lot of the fear that they're also trying to jump is like, oh, they're just going to hand the keys to Facebook. And it's like, mm -hmm. of course they're not going to hand it. No. Like there are, you know, well, so, antitrust laws in this country. It's not going to get handed over so, to so, Facebook. So that was the thing. And this is from from Trump's statement. It, it's, it's not like he's pro TikTok. With with a lot of things with Donald Trump, you 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 notice this is it's like it's like basic transactional things. And what he says is, if you get rid of TikTok, Facebook, and quote Zucker schmuck will double their business. If it, I don't want Facebook, who cheated in the last election, doing better, they are true enemies of the people, is what Trump says, which I thought was very interesting because in typical Trump fashion, it's like break the fourth wall. Yep. It's like not about the policy. Yep. It's about you know, 2020 and all of this sort of stuff rather than the United States versus China, which is like obviously a bigger priority right now than his apparent anger at, at Facebook. But uh, from this Axios article, there's an interesting thing happening right now, and it, it's percolated a lot since uh, that vote uh, in the House <clears throat> uh, from the article, one potential factor at play is Trump's newly repaired relationship with billionaire Jeff Yass, who has been a huge financial stake, who has a huge financial stake in ByteDance and has spent millions backing lawmakers to support TikTok. Days before his TikTok reversal, Trump publicly praised Yass for inviting him to a retreat held by the Club for Growth, a powerful conservative group that also opposes banning the app. He's also donated to Vivek Ramaswamy. Remember, Vivek did his thing His, with Logan Paul or whatever. One of the worst flip-flops I think we've ever seen. Yeah, and, and Vivek Ramaswamy had previously called TikTok digital fentanyl. Which is such a good description a, it is. of what TikTok is. He, dude, he's one of the best. Like, I have said a lot of things making fun of Vivek Ramaswamy, but no one can argue that he isn't a fantastic communicator. No, you know and that's I mean? the thing. If you watched his sort of progression on Saturday night of editing his tweet multiple times. He first tweeted, essentially, you know, Donald Trump has come out against a ban of TikTok and he, I support it, here's why. And he edited it multiple times through the night as he got pushback from people like, right. like Solana and others. First who said, one, it's not a ban. Mm -hmm. And if TikTok can't exist without ByteDance, that's a pretty big tell. If right. divesting that's from the, the Chinese the Communist yeah. Party yes. would kill your app or ban it, 
that's the problem. You're right. telling on yourself there. But the other point that he really got pushback on was the financial ties here with Jeff Yass and and other and other you know sort of dynamics going into that. And I think it was very interesting that he changed his tweet first from legislative ban, and then he edited it also to say if we're going to force you know divestment from. TikTok, we should be forcing divestment from anything that China, you know, controls data. But basically, if, you know, I don't want to, you know, take action against TikTok unless we can get everybody all at once, which is an absurd PR strategy. Right. But I think as we're it's talking... All, it's also, just for people who've worked a legislative process before, a way that people force a poison yep. pill into legislation yep. that would otherwise pass. They're like, this isn't good enough, but also we have to do X, Y, and Z. Yes, if we and this can't, is a classic strategy yes. of people who actually don't want to do the thing. That's exactly what it is. And I also just think as far as following the money on this issue, I don't know that we've seen such an overt example of you know defenders popping out of nowhere and then within 10 minutes someone on Twitter's pointing out oh they took 3 million dollars from yes right. this person took 12 million so it's just it's it's not very difficult to see the threads there so the uh, the statement from Josh Hawley um, you know who's of the opposite opinion here said quote I'm not a fan of Facebook but TikTok is qualitatively a different deal it's a backdoor for the communist chinese party he told reporters which I think is like, there's the rub. Yep. It's like, this is a fundamentally different thing. It's not about helping yep. Facebook or any other social media network. It's about the thing that this is a Chinese spyware yep. app. Why do we allow? I mean, like, think about all the stories we've seen over the last few months about how, the, how about the spying China's been doing at our ports with these, like, cameras on stuff. And they put Wi-Fi on all the cranes at our ports. That yeah, they right. Over here. It's unreal. Right. I or, mean, the, or the drones. You've talked about this previously, Smug, the that, drones. That's the thing. So uh, examples like DJI, who is – they make the drones that you can buy at Best Buy. They're Chinese-made, and China maintains a backdoor into every single one of those drones. It's especially heartbreaking because if you want a drone and you wanted an American-made one – the American-made manufacturing stopped making commercial drones two years ago. So essentially, they've cornered the market. No right. matter what you do, if you buy a drone, essentially, it's going to be a Chinese-made one that's going to be collecting data that everywhere you fly, they can see where it is. You should be worried about the same things with, like, uh, you know, when you get your home uh, 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 alarm systems and everything. Mm -hmm. China's making those to monitor everything. Mm. To me, this is no different than, like, what kind of argument could be made to allow that Chinese spy balloon? Yep. Like, oh, well, look, listen, guys, uh, you know, it's a first amendment thing. Maybe China just wants to fly a balloon. Uh, it, it hasn't killed anybody. Right. Like, let's be serious. Like, uh, what kind of argument can be made when we have seen the direct yep. results of what happens when China is capable of manipulating the youth of this country? We've well, seen what it does. And that's such an important point because it gets into this political discussion that I think has been kind of glossed over. When you hear some of TikTok's defenders, they say we are – angering uh, Gen Z voters, and it will have political damage for us. Have you seen how Gen Z voters vote? They yeah. are not voting for Republicans, but that's not what this is about, because you see that this is incredibly bipartisan. Mark Warner in the Senate has been one of the strongest advocates for you know, forcing divestment from ByteDance for TikTok. You know, it's Democrats that have been very involved here. And one of the reasons I think this is so potent, Pew polled last March how Americans feel about banning TikTok. Now, again, to be clear, we're not talking about banning TikTok. We're talking about forcing divestment. But for the sake of discussion, the Pew polling was very interesting because it showed, one, a majority of people were perfectly comfortable banning TikTok. A majority of people. The only people that really were against it were your Gen Z Americans. Right, right. But the, the nugget from that poll that I thought was most interesting was when people hear that TikTok is owned by a parent company that is controlled by the CCP, it is 60% to 11 in favor of banning TikTok. So the more people know China's controlling this app, the more they support getting rid of it. The only people who really were against banning TikTok in this poll were people that were unaware that ByteDance is controlled by the CCP, which you know is, of course, what owns TikTok. I, so I think it's just really important to note that as we talk about the political dynamics of, around TikTok, there is a huge segment of Americans who, like Smug is talking about, are very concerned about China and China's sort of threats and spying on America, who 
never saw any accountability for COVID, mm -hmm. who are concerned about yep. spy balloons, who are concerned yeah. about threats to Taiwan. That is a giant segment of the country. And those people overwhelmingly support American companies getting out of China, stopping doing business in China, having more things made in America. And that's where I think people like Josh Hawley come into this. They yeah. are very much focused on how can we get more business out of China into America. And I think that it's fascinating to see the sort of different unique bedfellows on this TikTok well, fight. Yeah. I think what's really important here is the the, the TikTok part is just a small mm -hmm. appetizer mm -hmm. to what I think is the future issues in, in tech vis-a-vis -vis United States and China. I mean, like, think about what the, the economy of the future is going to look like with things like AI and quantum yep. computing and all of these sorts of things. And this isn't going to be the first time that we have to make a decision of whether we're going to have, you know, tech dominance here at home in these new mm -hmm. things or whether we're going to let China run, you know, over us. That's right. You know, and and, right. and and who's going to actually control the future of the Internet and all of these technologies, us or China? Yep. That's dude. That's the heart of it is that China has seen the success that they've had in being able to manipulate and harm this country yep. with TikTok the same way they have with fentanyl. So like when Vivek was of that opinion, he was dead right. It is digital fentanyl. And the reason that TikTok through their, you know, controllers in China are going to fight so hard against the sale is because it is not just another social media app to them. It is a spying tool that is worth so much more than, say, you know, the tens of billions of dollars Elon spent buying Twitter. It has such a more higher value to them than anything like that. And so that's where we're going to have trouble seeing, you know, a sale like this actually yeah. allow. Could you imagine them actually having to talk about like where they find value in this yep. technology where they're like, well, we did, had facial recognition of every Uyghur in China and that's worth a lot of money to us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. They're not giving that up easily. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's wild. It's a wild, <laughs> wild story. We got to get here uh, to an even wilder story somehow uh, <laughs> somehow even crazier than that and that is uh haiti haiti oh, um you know uh it's another embassy now evacuated by the biden administration do we have, wait, one do we have a count yeah. what's the current count on uh, embassies yeah that let's biden has let's throw up graphic number one <laughs> graphic number one spaghetti. Yeah. Wow. So uh, under Joe Biden, we've evacuated Sudan, Ukraine, Haiti, Afghanistan, Belarus, and Niger, too. Uh, Niger. Yeah. Or Niger. I don't know how to pronounce it on the news. Or Glad you guys picked that one, not me. Well, <laughs> I, I, think I think Niger is right. Ni but Ni Niger is like the French pronun pronunciation. Niger, and then that sounds better. Yeah. 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 I just. <laughs> I feel like in, in elementary school, it was just everyone said Niger, and that sounded right to me. Yeah. Uh, and so I, Niger or Niger is another one that yes. our embassy had to be evacuated. Absolutely. Um, so what's going on in Haiti right now is absolutely wild. Uh, basically chaos and cannibalism. Oh, you know. It's wild. You know. Uh, <laughs> just the standard just very, fare. Very normal stuff. Um, the U.S., EU, and Germany evacuated diplomatic staff from Haiti over violence. Uh, they airlifted non-essential embassy staff from Haiti in an overnight evacuation and boosted security at the capital in Port-au-Prince due to escalating gang violence, American defense officials said on Sunday. Ha Haitian officials have declared a state of emergency and nighttime curfew in response to days of attacks on the capital's airport and other targets by gangs seeking the ouster of the Caribbean nation's prime minister, Ariel Henry. You think it's Henry or you think it's Henri? Henri? It's got to be Henri, gotta right? Be Henri. More, more French. Yeah. More French. Uh, so as we said, this is the sixth embassy, uh, embassy evacuated under Joe Biden. But we got to get to, uh, I think, what is the most wild part of this entire thing from the New York Post. Uh, the gang leader, who's now the most powerful person in Haiti, uh, his nickname is Barbecue. Yeah. I saw him called General Barbecue. <laughs> Online, which is very different than like a Colonel Sanders. Like, this isn't a guy running a restaurant. No. No, it sounds like a good restaurant, but not in the Haitian <laughs> version. Of it. Not, 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 not this a fan kind of the Haitian barbecue. Oh, Eastern Carolina. This is dark. 
I think just one, I mean, one point about this story that's been fascinating to me that I think Rick Grinnell made a, a good point about it on Twitter is billions of dollars in aid has gone to Haiti. So yes. this isn't an issue of not getting international funding and support. It's where has that gone? Is yep. there infrastructure to actually yeah. do something with that? And I think it goes back to so much of our foreign aid, yep. you know, a debate about can we actually see where it's going? This is U.S. tax dollars that have gone to places. Now in Haiti, who knows where a lot of that funding and support is going to go now that the country's devolved well, so, into this. So um, remember... Uh, Haiti was where the, there was that just devastating mm -hmm. earthquake back in, in 2010. And um, the Clinton Foundation put in millions and millions and millions of dollars into Haiti. And there's been a lot of reporting, subsequent reporting, about how that aid was squandered mm -hmm. and basically the Clintons wrecked And that's just squandered. Yeah, the, 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 there have been, there's been reports that they said that they spent millions, but they actually showed up and sopped up all the money. Yeah, yeah. Where they were like... Oh yes, we are sending people to assist with aid, and they showed up and just like sucked all the money up from NGOs and folded and left. Yeah. But also apparently, like the people that they sent had cholera, and they spread cholera throughout <laughs> the country. Jeez. It's like these people are a literal plague. So I I, I want to do a little bit of an experiment uh, here. Uh, Wolf has told me we have this technology to put a poll within our video oh, on YouTube, wow. and if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube, I I highly recommend you do. I have a question for my two friends here, and and I my question is, which do you think has been a bigger PR disaster for the Clintons? Do you think it's um, which island? Oh my God! Has it been Epstein Island or, or oh, Haiti? Geez. Oh jeez! Which know. which has been a bigger PR disaster? Wow. I don't know on, if that's really a competition. Which, <laughs> on which island do more children suffer? Due to Clinton. Clinton. <laughs> Oh no! Vote, that's a tough, <laughs> vote right now in our poll. That is a uh, tough poll. Oh, Take a dark YouTube. turn. Right yeah. there is why you subscribe to the YouTube. That's team. why. Because <laughs> you're gonna want to vote. You got to make your voice voice heard in that one. <laughs> and and I mean, so I I think this brings up a, a whole number of questions that I think it's a good time for for Americans to discuss is what is the value of the foreign aid that's been sent to Haiti. Yeah. What is the result of it? This is a country who, for two like two hundred years, has been independent, has been completely dependent on foreign nations for aid for this entire time. I think this is in my lifetime, like the ninth time the country's collapsed, tenth time. Like, yeah, this is about like you can set your watch every five or six years. Okay, it's going to collapse. There's going to be bloodshed. What's the solution here? I don't think the solution here is maybe if we send a little more foreign aid that this problem is going to be saved. Like at some point. And, you have to let people figure out their problems. We've seen uh, results of attempted nation building globally. It's been one of the roughest lessons America has had to learn at the start of the 21st century is what is the value of continuing aid? And beyond that, my issue with this and, and what I, I started looking into is the immigration question, because the Biden administration has fast-tracked mm -hmm. Haitian immigration. There's essentially... Uh, no illegal immigration from Haiti because they will instantly legalize Haitian immigration to this country. You can show up illegally from Haiti. Like, uh, I, I think there were 5,000 Haitians under an underpass yeah. at some point at the border. They all got let in. It's fine. It's normal. How is this becoming a policy of this country that not only are we going to have money taken from citizens of America overseas, now anyone who comes from overseas will make you a citizen? This seems like the most absurd policy like we talk about an open border this is like the next step to it and we saw earlier where he says uh in our opening of the show he's like well illegals built this country illegals built this country i don't think so <laughs> well i think one way of just bookmarking how long this has been an issue for and forgive me for the crassness of this but some of you might remember the 1995 classic film Clueless, yes. starring Alicia yes. Silverstone, yeah. of course, where she is in a sort of debate class and they ask her to describe whether or not we should be giving Haitians refugee status. And she 
makes a comparison to a garden party that she was having and ends it with, and I remind you, there's no RSVP at the bottom of the Statue of Liberty. This was 1995. Oh my God, yeah. that's such a good 30 point. 30 years later, we're still having the same conversation about how best to help and support Haiti. And I think it just shows that, you know, a lot of these problems are cyclical. Right. And, and, and also, like, it was supposed to be a joke that she's ditzy and was like, maybe if we just get into a kitchen with, like, the Hadians, yeah. we yeah, can make it work for everybody. Yeah. And, like, that's now become the policy of the Democrats. Yeah, so that's they're the like, thing. She you says, know what? You make a good point. So. She says the line. And so if the government just get to the kitchen, rearrange some things, we could certainly party with the Hadians. And I think that yeah. that is actually what a lot of Democrats have taken as their foreign policy with regard to Haiti. Literally and clueless the foreign Hadians. policy. Well, I, 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 would, I would like all of those liberals to meet Barbecue here. Yeah. Who's yeah. Jimmy? His name is Jimmy Cherizier. I think Cherizier. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna. That uh, sounds right. I'm gonna pronounce everything as sort of French here because I assume that's uh, that's where it's originating from. Here, uh, he's a leader of the notorious G9 and family gang, uh, and they're in, in command of the bulk of the gunmen who are stirring the anarchy at the Capitol. Uh, Wolf Spaghetti, don't we have some some video here of of what's going on there in the Capitol? Sadly, not the barbecue. So this isn't like. We're yeah. not going to get banned from YouTube for this. Yeah, I'm not going to see a cannibal on a, you know, <laughs> putting somebody on a spit, right? Let's play, let's play that footage. Now to the worsening violence in Haiti where armed gangs have overrun much of the capital. The U.S. military said yesterday that it airlifted non-essential staff from the U.S. Embassy in Port-au-Prince. It also flew in extra forces to beef up security. The Defense Department says the U.S. remains focused on aiding Haitian police and uh, arranging a U.N.-authorized security deployment. Haiti's embattled Prime Minister Ariel Henry is facing calls to resign. Henry is in Puerto Rico and remains unable to return home. Okay. He's in Puerto Rico. <laughs> He's in Puerto Rico. He's like, things are fine. I got it under <laughs> control. They just refilled the pina colada. Things are looking up. Unbelievable. So, I mean, this is a, a, an example. And then when they mentioned that, like, uh, the UN is going to help out. I think it was also the UN who showed up and they had all the instances of children being raped. Like, there is no solution to this problem. The UN is also one of these organizations that has not had the best results over the past 25 years of when they show up. Yeah. So the solution to this is going to have to be the people of Haiti decide what kind of government they want. And if they are interested in having a stable, working, functioning government society, it's going to come from the people of that society. Yeah, may maybe like... Don't let the Clintons in. Yeah, that that, that's a good start. Every time <laughs> they roll up, problems. Sure. Absolutely. Um, well, we've got some fantastic uh, variety here uh, <laughs> that we got to get to here in a second, uh, but we got to go to a commercial break real quick. I don't know if you guys saw this. Uh, Hollywood Hen was giving us the rundown this morning about this because, you know, she's basically an expert in these sorts of 100%. things uh, when it comes to the royal family. Personally, like, I don't really give a shit. All of the shit that they do is fake uh, because they're um, a fake royal family with no real power. But apparently this is very controversial in England. Uh, and that is from CBS News that Princess Kate, this is Kate Middleton, uh, admits she photoshopped an official image. No, she didn't admit it. Did she? Well, I don't that, think she did. Well, that's what Most the title says. Most people are attributing says. it to her. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. I thought at first that it was Will. Yeah, yeah, Will, who's uh, the 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 prince, the crown prince. Let's let's put up graphic two. <laughs> this is uh, basically just a normal oh, photo of her okay, with yeah. her kids, but apparently she hasn't been seen in public for months or something. Yeah, she so had a procedure and has not been seen, and it has led to massive Twitter speculation. I know this because my wife follows the royals. Okay. She has watched the crown and is invested in this and so she filled me in on all of this and the story is actually pretty crazy wow um just that she's been missing and it's led to conspiracy theories and you know the smartest thing to do when you're the subject of a conspiracy theory is release a doctor's image <laughs> yeah. with your children having too many fingers your face being photoshopped from another photo of yourself things like that, that is yeah, the so, best so way what is it that we're seeing here in this next <clears throat> image here there's a circle so like the hand would so this is her daughter's wrist where like is unconnected to the sweater and like you the see that? sleeve mm. is off and it just it looks like they tried to change the colors of clothes to ah. update from an older photo 
um, from a different season. And it also, someone was saying that they took Kate's face from another photo and put it on this one. And someone identified the old photo that it had been taken from. So it's pretty easy to track this. And what this reminds me most of is that great moment in the office when Michael Scott talks about how he's a whiz at Photoshop yeah. because he couldn't get the, the group photo together. And so you've got these like giant pumpkin heads of people that are pasted <laughs> on each other. But this is the royal family. Yeah. Like they don't have better PR strategic support than no. this. Dude, I just do, do not believe for a second. I mean, like I, I, I got to read this statement because it's hilarious. Like many amateur photographers, I do occasionally experiment with editing. <laughs> I wanted to express my apologies for any confusion the family photograph we shared yesterday caused. I hope everyone celebrating had a very happy Mother's Day. See. This is fake. So it's fake because yesterday wasn't Mother's Day. So <laughs> this is all full of lies. I don't believe these people. Well, it's just what, what I think is funny is the idea that the crown princess of Wales is actually like in Photoshop or Canva, yeah, like canvassing on her cell like phone, in the like, lab, in the lab, take like putting the face this together. From this photo, oh, Reggie looks good, and oh, sorry, I it's just abs- it's just absurd, right? Yeah, this it's is crazy. This is all fake. So here's the thing, I, I saw uh, the story like a few steps ago, I guess, when um, Reuters, AP, and everyone put out a bulletin that said, "Stop putting this photo up on articles. We believe mm-hmm. it's doctored." And I guess subsequently, she released this statement. Number one, she wasn't on video. It's not video of her issuing the statement. It was written, mm-hmm. okay? And then I saw uh, 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 a tweet this morning from the news saying that, oh, uh, this is her in a car with her the bald prince. <laughs> in a, and she's, they're like... William she, the bald. The bald. <laughs> That's yeah. going to be his nickname. <laughs> she's facing the other way, so you don't even see the face of the lady in the car. Dude, this is all fake. My theory, I'm not a doctor. I don't know anything. My theory, she's dead. She got like a, no. some kind of a cosmetic surgery, no. and it went bad. She's dead, hundred percent dead. Why would you Here's say the thing. that? If she was getting like a medical procedure, that it was something serious, like okay, this is like for breast cancer or something like that, the royal family would be farming sympathy so hard. They're in a war right now with, with Meghan Markle, with Meghan Markle and the bastard prince. Many <laughs> the people say the redhead one, the fake son. He's not king's. King's son, you know, he's are not Charles' get, son. Are you going to get a in suit opinion, by the crown? I don't think, in my opinion, he doesn't look like his dad. There were many people no, no, who were the, saying... No, no, that's the thing. It's like, it, it's, you are right. Yeah. Many people are saying yeah. that, in fact, he is They not. call him the cut king, man, for real. <laughs> he's doing like a Stannis Baratheon kind of end run. Totally. He looks like the redhead guy that would hang around, uh, uh, die before she got killed. Many people are saying, like the queen princess, had it with princess her. Princess die. Maybe even the queen had it with this one. You don't know. That family likes offing people. But I, from beyond the grave, maybe she's actually alive. Why do we? <laughs> anything could happen here. I will tell you, this has been hilarious on Twitter. I yes. don't spend a lot of time messing around with like the the royal family Twitter universe. This has been very funny. The photoshops people have come up with to make fun of this, <laughs> but also so the process by which they pull back that photo. It's called a kill notification when they find out a photo has oh been manipulated. Yeah. And so AP, AFP received this, quote, kill notification from the royal family from, I guess they call them the firm. I, yeah. you know, to kill. Not- and so when kill notification started trending on Twitter, people were like, wait a sec, you're going to kill her for a bad Photoshop? <laughs> yeah. And it was all very funny because we know, you know, the Tower of London, like they kill people for they do know, they for much them. less much less Thank, than thankfully we don't have to care about this in <laughs> 1776 yep but oh. a hilarious story check it out on twitter just scroll through because i think this brought out some of the great humor that comes from the british twitter universe yeah that is actually pretty savage um to the royals and everybody else deservedly so they're terrible people <laughs> it's not happen to worse people i think she's probably dead in my opinion <laughs> You sound so much like Trump when you it's say, I think she's probably dead. Who knows? I don't know. She's probably dead. Many are saying. I love TikTok. <laughs> okay, so we got to get to this next story, which I, I can only begin to imagine what Smug is going to oh, say about it. I was so ready for it. this when I saw it. I know you're just like gassed up to, to talk about it. Uh, the headline here from the Wall Street Journal is, Airlines are coming for your carry-ons. Mm-hmm. Southwest Airlines gate agent rattled off so many items that counted toward the two carry-on bag limit on my flight to Baltimore. I thought it might be a playful jab at Spirit and Frontier in their rigid carry-on policing to collect more fees. But this was no joke. Southwest quietly began cracking down on carry-on bags on February 22nd ahead of the spring and summer travel rush, advising gate agents of the changes in a memo. 
This crackdown isn't about bag size. It's about how many bags you have. Thoughts? <laughs> Brutal. Good. Good? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Crack down 10 times harder. When I go to the airport, so here's what's happened here, is too many people think that airline travel is like a God-given right. Like the founding fathers said, you know, you, you have free speech and you can fly anywhere you want in the country at any time. That's your legal right. It is not. So you get all these people who are trying to... It's like five bucks to check in luggage, I guess, right? Something no, like that. it's not. Well, it's always free, you know? <laughs> I don't know how much it costs. I don't know how much it is for the people in the back, but it's the people in the back who have ruined it for everybody is the thing. They'll come up like they're moving, bro. They're like, oh, how, many, how many things can I stuff in a, quote, carry-on, right? None of that fits in the little, little metal bin that's next to the, the to, next to the gate. Yeah. And they know it, and they've been getting away with it. I think it's Crack true. Crack down on these people. So, We're already paying for them to fly. They yeah. got like a $5 ticket to Hawaii that everyone else is having to So I, normally I disagree with you on stuff like this, but this is one time that we are perfectly aligned. Yep. And I have noticed this a lot recently, is that people will come up with their carry-on bag, like a regular roller bag that they're going to put up, up top, right? But then they've got their purse or their backpack and then they've got like their pf chang's bag yeah yeah you know stinking up the place and they yeah. got some and, and <laughs> got a bag of baby bag of baby food in and, there and they just sort of haphazardly like put them in one bag to kind of show the agent oh i've got one additional carry-on and like this is totally legal and then you get halfway down the jet bridge and they're like swinging them like they just came to from from like the mall yeah you know and then they're like they're they're taking up all the space uh, below their feet. They're they're cramming too much in the overhead, and it's gotten out of control. It, it, the, every flight is delayed because the people in the back are trying to stuff five hundred bags into like ten overhead. Bins. And invariably, we run out of space, right? It's and then, always going to happen. And then it delays the pushback. Yeah, because then all the little, they're all fighting. They're like, uh, "Whose bag are you going to have to check in?" It's like, listen, that is a, like a, it's a check-in bag first off that you're trying to roll onto this plane. And now there's ten people who are having some kind of like a you know a Mexican standoff, staring at each other of who's going to have to take the pink tag at the jet bridge. We're all getting our time wasted. You know what with I this hate? Stupid shit. You know for what, someone to say five bucks. You know what I hate the most though is especially during like winter travel because in, in addition to the carry on plus the purse or backpack plus the PF Changs or the Jimmy Johns or the Five Guys, it's also like the heavy down coat. Yep. Yeah. You know, and so people are like putting their down coat in the overhead as as if like. Their coat has equal say as like my carry-on bag, and it's just getting absurd. They they gotta go. They gotta go. I mean, th this this problem like, this might be the only good thing Southwest has ever done. <laughs> I guess. Like, Aren't you a Southwest guy? Absolutely not. No, he's absolutely a big not. Southwest guy. I, I think I think families should be forced onto Southwest <laughs> if they right. can't that's... get their children to behave on flights. I think that's the option. It's <clears> like you choose steerage, or you choose normal airlines. And then for people who choose normal airlines. You know, you might think for a second, okay, well, at least all the kids are on Southwest. No. Now you're going to end up with the people who are trying to stuff 15 pieces of luggage. And they're mad about, like, oh, wow, why is my check-in or, or carry-on luggage being considered carry-on? Everybody just, like, you will save yourself so much stress and, 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 and your, your mental health will be saved if you just check in your luggage. It's a magical thing. These guys know they're always puzzled when we show up to travel and I have a massive trunk I wheel it in, I check it in, and then I get on the airplane and I'm fine. When you get there, it's going to be there. It's the first one. But then one you got to go to the baggage claim at the yeah, end. Well, that, that, see, going to, the see, baggage claims at the end. That okay. guy from the Biden administration, you're going to take he it might and run it. away <laughs> okay. with your fancy luggage. I, I will tell you, yeah. ever since that happened with that guy from the Biden administration who steals bags luggage. of the baggage claim, I get stressed when I have a check bag. Now I've got kids, so I have to check bags. Right, right. I race. Like, someone's like, I got to go to the bathroom. I'm like, okay, you go to the bathroom. I'll meet you there because I got to monitor that baggage claim in case that guy or someone like him is going to try and walk Dude, out I, with one of our check bags. Pro tip, air tag it. Air tag it. I, do, I have air tags on. I'm, air I agree tag with everything. That. I agree with that. I have air tags on literally everything that I go to the airport with. My only beef with this is flying right now is so insanely expensive. And all the airlines kind of hold hands and jump together. Yeah. So, like, the same article has Delta and every other airline also talking about these check bag fees. I would be great with t trying this out at a time when it wasn't, like, $900 to go from D.C. to Utah. Mm. You know, like, that flight used to be five, $600. Now, you can't find one that's 
that's not more than a thousand dollars. Yeah. So tacking on like forty five dollars for a rollerboard if I happen to be traveling by myself is kind of annoying. But at the same time, there's a convenience factor. If it's what they're doing, I'll go with it. But airline travel is out of control, and you know whose fault it is? Who? Pete Butt. Oh, Pete is it, Butt. It, it is. Pete Butt did this. It is his fault. So the only reason we're even having to have this conversation is Pete Butt. Oh, terrible. I can't stand Poot. Poot. <laughs> Poot. <laughs> Fucking poot. But I'm happy. I hope the crackdown continues and all these people who are causing problems go to Southwest. <laughs> okay, so we've got a update here, a, a subject that's near and dear to your heart, Smug. Yeah. I can't wait to hear your take. Uh, the enhanced games. We covered this on the show, I think a month or two ago, and this is basically going to be like an Olympics where they allow doping, basically. <laughs> Performance enhancing drugs. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And it'll all be monitored by doctors at all yes. times. All athletes will always be monitored by doctors. Um, <clears throat> so this is from, the, I don't know what website this is. McDaniel pulls this stuff out of his ass. Swim Swam? It's highly respectable Swim Swam. <laughs> swim Swam. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, the background here is that retired world champion James Magnuson said Thursday that he would juice to the gills to break the 50-meter freestyle world record if offered $1 million by the Enhanced Games, a budding rival to the Olympics that does not require drug testing. That is awesome. That's Juice to the crazy. gills. See, this is this is about marching forward. This is progress. This is actual human progress. Because yeah. for so long, like we've had to deal with limitations on how great humans can be. We've been fighting with one arm tied behind our back. I want to see not just, you know, this is just the beginning. We'll be able to see how... How fast a juice to the gills dude can swim, right? Like, yeah. like what was the name of the guy? He was like he, uh, shaped like a fish. Michael Michael Phelps, right? He was, yeah, he was shaped yeah. like a fish. He was yeah. Shaped like a fish. Michael Phelps. So imagine if we juice that guy, right? And like I, I said earlier, and a lot of like across the country, this movement has caught on. After I said, yeah, the people. You spoke for the people. This is just like Pokemon, where you'll start getting the juiced people, and we start breeding them, and it'll yeah. make super juiced people who are even better athletes and more entertaining and faster and stronger. And then we could get to like MMA. So imagine like super juiced MMA fighters. I don't want to see This'll that. Be, everyone wants. Everyone says I don't want to see that. Everyone would pay top. How dollar. much more fun was baseball in the Barry Bonds, Sammy Sosa, Mark? So much look, more I, fun. I, you go to a game and you're going to see a ball point. go to space. Whitlock, Great Whitlock. Point. I, Great I, point. I, I, I agree. I agree with you. But Roger Clemens and Barry Bonds weren't punching each other. That's the difference. But oh, wouldn't oh, it have been better if they were? <laughs> it would be better. <laughs> wouldn't it have been better if they were? Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine? I want Barry Titans Bonds. with one giant arm and one that's, like, kind of baby-sized, like, yeah. slugging each other. I want Barry Bonds to be, like, for, for $10 million, I'll be juiced to the gills. Home Run Derby. I do Home Run Derby. Yes. I would watch that in a second. I would pay for a pay-per-view. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. So, yeah, pros and cons. Well, so there's more here. Um, you know, financially supported by billionaire entrepreneur Peter Thiel, the Enhanced Games quickly put out a statement confirming that Magnus would, would receive a million dollars if he breaks Cesar Cielos? Cielo? Cielos? Uh, legendary 50 free uh, standard of 20.91 20 sec 20 seconds at the Enhanced Games, tentatively scheduled for next summer, Magnus. I'm going to be there. I'm still going. Dude, so wh uh, where is the Enhanced Games going to be, though? We need to figure that out because I, I think we, we thought about maybe doing a live show from it, right? Yeah. So I noticed the Enhanced Games, after we discussed it, started following me on Twitter, and I am extremely serious <laughs> about this. Like, you will not find anyone so pro of what is being done here they've announced now it's going to be i guess in a few months by the next summer that's what they mean right not like a yeah. year from now so in a few months it'll be happening i'd like them to firm up a location and dude i we need to know the location yeah i will be there boots on the ground covering this this is here, here's the thing is right now i think everyone is like oh there's no way this is going to happen this is not going to work i guarantee like they've got the financial backing this is going to happen and I bet very quickly people will realize that this is so much more entertaining. Like, this is essentially just watching a nonstop home run derby. This is going to be people just going and breaking records nonstop. Like, you know, uh, oh, gosh, what was his name? Um, the marathon runner um, who, who made – th there's, like, these Nike shoes that Nike had to design. Prefontaine. No, no, no. The, it, it just, it, like, within the past five no. years, they, they made the shoe illegal because no. it was that good. They had to, like, re-engineer it. This is what's about. This is humans going forward, using technology to be faster, stronger, bigger, more powerful. I cannot wait. I think everyone's going to see this and see records are going to be broken. Oh, Wolf just said 2025 location not chosen. Okay, so one year. 
Okay. One year. We're gonna it's going to be in Vegas. I, I know it's going to be I hope Vegas. it's Vegas. If it's in Vegas, we're going to have the biggest live show in it's the Ruthless po- Podcast 2025, history. President Trump cutting the ribbons at the Enhanced Games at the Trump Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, presented by Ruthless. Let's I'm, go. Yeah. Could not Let's be a go. better event. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. I absolutely love it. <laughs> uh, fellas, uh, we got to get to this interview with Akash Shaguli from uh, AFP. He's got some great stuff and their great new website, Bidenomics. Let's get right to that. I want to welcome to the program a good friend of the program, Akash Shaguli, uh, with AFP. Uh, AFP has been a great partner of the Variety program. Uh, I've done some uh, some events. Um, you've been a great sponsor, so we thought we'd bring you on for this sponsored segment. How are you? I am good. Thank you for having me on. Um, so AFP, you guys do obviously everything. You know, largest conservative grassroots organization in the country. Um, but you've got this new initiative, uh, Bidenomics, Bidenomics.com, which I think is fantastic. But I think before we get into that, what I'd really love to hear from you, because you work so much on these economic issues and pushing back on the Biden administration, what was your reaction to Joe Biden's State of the Union? My initial reaction was that this White House is completely unaware of why their approval ratings are in the tank to begin with. <laughs> yeah, it is beyond amazing people are pointing to polls saying oh people liked his ideas of course you like free stuff when you have no sense of the consequences no sense of how much it's going to cost no sense of how realistic it is or how likely it is to pass when in reality if you go an inch deep into anything he proposed it's more spending more class warfare and more policies that are going to drive inflation which is why no one can stand this administration to begin with yeah. Um. <laughs> that, I mean, that was the first thing is whenever he would mention these new programs he wanted, it was like we already forgot previous day of the unions where he was like, OK, here's how we're going to spend trillions of more dollars, trillions of more dollars. Inflation keeps going up. And he's like, well, let's just keep going to it. Yeah. You know, that, it seems like that's been working well for working families. Yeah. So, so uh, on on the cost uh, of things, what I think is interesting is this push uh, from the president. And, and also Cookie Monster. I know if you guys uh, saw this, uh, this idea of shrinkflation, which I think originated with uh, Elizabeth Warren. You know, she was really trying to carry the torch on that thing a while ago. But uh, explain, you know, to our listeners what, what the Biden administration is trying to do there by sort of like reframing inflation as shrinkflation. Yeah, well, first, the first thing they're trying to do is reinvigorate their progressive base, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing about policy or the truth or anything that matters to the vast majority of Americans that they're trying to do. No matter how ridiculous what they're saying is, their number one priority is reinvigorating their progressive base going into November because the base is not excited about Joe Biden, and Mm -hmm. why would they be? What they're trying to do with shrinkflation, greedflation, all this stuff, is distract from how his policies have caused inflation to begin with, right? And it's it's not a secret. You don't need a degree in economics to know that when you dump six trillion additional dollars into the economy, which is what they did under the Biden, Pelosi, Schumer regime of last Congress, an additional six trillion dollars in spending, you do nothing to increase supply of goods and services. Obviously, that's going to raise prices. Right. They turn around like they do with everything, blame it on quote unquote evil corporations. Yeah. <laughs> they point to shrinkflation, greedflation, as though, one, costs didn't go up for corporations, and two, as though there was some point at which Elizabeth Warren didn't think corporations were evil and greedy. Mm. They just now became evil and greedy because inflation is really high and Joe Biden's poll numbers are in the tank. Right. Um, Again, the American people are not that dumb. They see that prices are going up, and it has nothing to do with corporations. They're going up for small businesses. They're going up for families. Mm -hmm. Uh, And at the end of the day, the average American family is spending $11,400 more today to Jeez. afford the same quality of life as they had before President Biden took office. Yeah, it's not like uh, they're having bad quality of life because their their candy bar is smaller. Right? Yeah, <laughs> and I, I mean, just like it, this is all predicated on some kind of like conspiracy theory that one day every major corporation got together in the room. They're like, let's hike the prices, gentlemen. Yeah. This has no- <laughs> nothing to do with inflation. We're just deciding today's a day we're going to just hike prices together at the same time. Yeah, now's the time to really cash in. We weren't trying to make money before, yeah. but now because Joe Biden's numbers are in the toilet, we're going to decide if we, we need to make some more money. <laughs> I mean, it's just bonkers. It is. And, and like you said, $11,000 more to get nothing, to get no difference, just to be where you started is Unbelievable. That burden that's being put on households across this country. I mean, it, and for this president to go out and, and act like that was some kind of like a victory speech is like things are going well. Binomics is working. This was a plan all along, folks. Isn't, aren't things great? And, and like you said, that 
they think there's no reason that this is connected to why the poll numbers are bad. Yeah. It's it's a policy. It's their policy that's being judged. It's it's very straightforward. Um, and it's actually, you're paying for it in more ways than one. And this, this is the thing that we're trying to do at Bidenomics.com. And we've got a massive campaign that's going to run through the fall educating voters on how policies have caused the problems they're facing. The problems go way beyond you know, a candy bar or even the price of gas or the price of groceries. You're actually paying for it in two or three different ways. So prices are up, obviously, on, on household items and things like that. Then you've got higher interest rates, right? Mm -hmm. So if your family is growing and you need a new car or a new home, these are things that like embody the American dream for the vast majority of people. I mean, I'm 34. Right? People my age are trying to buy their first home or you know get a, a car for the first time that's you know different than the one they drove in high school or something. Joe Biden's policies are putting that stuff out of reach for more and more people. And so you're then paying for it that second way. And then we're going to pay for it again when this stuff all has to be paid for in the form of higher taxes. Right, right now, China is salivating at the con at the idea of us being thirty four trillion dollars in debt, and what that's going to mean for our fiscal situation. Our interest on the debt alone today exceeds how much we spend on national defense. Mm. The idea that we're only paying for this level of spending in higher gas prices and groceries right. today uh, is a very short sighted way to think of things. And, and Joe Biden, of course, is not going to tell you the truth. So we're doing it at Bidenomics.com. Well, so what I love about the website and the left's been better at this for us for a very, very long time. So I'm really glad we're we're doing it. But like uh, just setting it up simply as the rhetoric versus reality, your classic, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the digital guy. So we would call this like a myths versus facts okay. website. You know, every good campaign has one for when they get on the debate stage, when their opponent starts lying about them. Uh, so it's, you know, at Bidenomics.com here, the one thing you just mentioned it earlier um, <clears throat> is the ability to afford homes. And what Joe Biden says here, here's the, the quote, you got to love this. We're growing in an economy from the middle out and the bottom up instead of the top down. Bidenomics is just another way of saying the American dream. And uh, we've got like 7% mortgage rates. Yep. Um, if you're lucky. You know, so if you, <laughs> you know, if you are like a millennial or a Zoomer looking at, you know, buying your first home or condo or apartment or whatever, I mean, you've never paid higher interest rates. <laughs> no, not in your lifetime. I mean, it was, I, I, every friend likes to dunk on me and say that when Trump was in office, they got their house at 2%. Right. Yeah. Get that locked in. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and like you said, on this website is, th this is great, not just because, you know, you have his lies, direct quotes. These are all direct quotes on this website, which is what I love from Joe Biden. And then right next to it, the actual data and the facts. This is also great because you can then pull this out of your pocket. Right. At a family gathering. Yeah, like you're at, the, <laughs> you're at the bar. Yeah. You know. When, when your aunt wants to say how great Joe Biden's doing, give me one second. And Bidenomics.com, how do they not buy that website to that, begin with? Huge mistake on that. That is the challenge. I've done a hundred conservative grassroots events at the time being at AFP. Going out and telling people that we own Bidenomics.com is going to be a challenge in and of itself because people are not going to believe it. You've got a White House full of millennial and yep. Gen Z TikTokers right. who live online, seem like they've never touched grass before, yeah. and they skip like <laughs> Digital 101 because they're too busy telling Joe Biden to use like DEI-approved vocab talking about illegal immigration. Yes. It's amazing they didn't do this. And so we jumped on the opportunity, and we're using it to fact-check Joe Biden because they won't tell us the truth. So I've got a theory about this, why they didn't secure the domain. Like, you remember when they rolled it out originally, and it was basically just like a talking point for the chattering classes, like the media, and they hadn't really convinced themselves that it was a good idea to use Bidenomics as a slogan for the broader electorate. And so they sort of backed away from it a little bit. And like very quickly, the right was like, oh, we'll talk about oh. Bidenomics. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now we have a name for this horrible thing that's happening yeah, in the country. Yeah, yeah. No, it's wonderful. And um, yeah, I appreciate you guys putting it together because like Smug said, it's like, you know, everybody talks to their neighbors. They talk yeah. to their friends. They talk to their family here over the next eight, nine months or whatever. And it's nice to have like the quick little factoids at your fingertips. Otherwise, it gets lost in the back and forth of arguing about you know the headlines of the day. I, I'm waiting for him to come out and attack us. It's just a matter of time until uh, you know powerful Democrats realize who they're afraid of. It was Obama. He name checked us. If you remember Harry Reid, I'm sure Holmes remembers. Oh yeah, yeah. Harry Reid yeah. almost daily was on the Senate floor disparaging us. Uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, my home state of Rhode Island, does oh, it all he's a, the time. He's a terrible still. guy. <laughs> I, I'm still waiting for the invite to his beach club. I'm not holding yeah. my breath. Uh, I, 
at some point they're going to realize that we're doing this. I'm sure they've seen this already. Um, but by then, hopefully the American people, again, understand that it's Joe Biden and the people who voted for his agenda who caused this inflation crisis that we're in. That's all we're concerned about. And this is how we win is because so many Americans, this is how he kind of like tricked his way into office the first time. Like, oh, this is harmless Uncle Joe. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just a nice old guy. Right here, you go Bidenomics.com and saying this is all the problems that you're facing are directly related to policies that he spearheaded, he put in place. This is all on him. So the more people realize he's the person to hold accountable, he'll be held accountable. And, and the people already understand that. If you look at any of the polling, you know, I mean, his economic numbers are in the absolute toilet uh, because of all this stuff. It's like you don't really have to spin any of these facts. The facts are facts. The polls are the polls for a reason. Yep. Everybody's living through this economy. So I'm curious... Yeah, you know, you got this uh, great website, all the information out there. What are the other components of this campaign um, are you going to have going here over the next uh, nine months? Absolutely. People who know AFP, they know our bread and butter. It's being out in the states. Mm -hmm. We're at, now, as of last year, active in all 50 states. We've got physical state chapters uh, in 35 states. And so in key states this year, we'll be on the ground door knocking, mm -hmm. making phone calls, doing events, running digital ads, doing real, genuine grassroots outreach like we've been doing. We're coming up on our 20th anniversary. So we've 20 years of doing this stuff. We're not new. We don't pack up the day after election day. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing is hammering home these messages with ads, with mail, with door knocks, with phone calls, obviously, you know, social media and the whole works. Um, because again, we know what we're up against. You guys talk about it all the time. The mainstream media is not going to tell Americans the truth about how right. Biden's agenda caused this inflation crisis. You know, if you've got a member of Congress who's parading around saying, I'm a moderate, I'm this, I'm that. Um, and then they voted for $6 trillion in additional spending and drove this inflation crisis. You need to know that when they call themselves a moderate, they were not a moderate mm -hmm. when it came to government spending. And that's why you're paying, you know, $70 more uh, for groceries every week and, and their grocery bills higher than it's ever been. So we're going to be telling people the truth every which way between now and November. Yeah. That's terrific. And like you said, that grassroots army that AFP has is enormous. I mean, like they carry a huge weight making sure Republicans get elected across this country and fighting this agenda. Well, and I love it because I think you're exactly right. You have a lot of people who call themselves moderates, and we'll see all these ads here over this fall. You know how they all begin. It's like, you know, I stood up to, you know, leaders in both parties to work across the aisle for common sense solutions for blah, 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 blah. And then you look at their voting record, and it's like, no, you're just as responsible as Joe Biden yep. is for all of this. Yep, yeah. yep, that's yeah. exactly it. There is a lesson here for Republicans, too, though. I think this is mm -hmm. important, which is, you sort of have this new breed of Republicans who are saying like, oh, you know, free markets don't work anymore. We need to we need to become big spenders and we need to embrace government. And, and you've got like J.D. Vance applauding Lena Khan and, and Biden's bureaucrats and things like that. It's a relatively simple formula is right. the thing, right? People actually don't want class warfare. They don't want Washington intruding in their lives. All they want is for government to get out of the way give themselves and their kids a chance to build the American dream. I think if Republicans get back to that this year, obviously you know, the border is a mess. That's a super, super important issue. But mm -hmm. on the economy, it's a relatively simple formula. We saw what worked. Tax cuts work. Deregulation works. Getting government out of the way and letting the American people innovate is something not only is great policy and grows the economy, but people like it. And, and, we, it saw, and we saw it work in the Trump administration. That's the thing. You know, I mean, like we saw this actually yeah. happen. And you can't complain about the inflation if you're not opposed to the spending. Totally. You just can't. It's that simple. Uh, well, I really appreciate you coming in. Uh, you know, thanks again for such being such a loyal friend of the program. Always. You know, uh, that's Bidenomics.com for our listeners. Check it out. If you've got a crazy aunt, someone you that's can it. annoy. Th this is it to dunk on. Yeah, it's with, like a dunking machine. <laughs> Bidenomics.com. Just facts and information. Send them. Bidenomics.com. Akash, thanks again. Awesome. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Yep. Thanks so much. So that's great. He's a great guy, and I think they're doing the Lord's work over there with this website. Uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, Bidenomics.com, uh, you know, give it to your liberal relatives. It's got all the facts on there. <laughs> It'll make them very, very, very angry. Well, and it's so important and timely, right? Because right. we've got Biden spending millions of dollars trying to shift blame to things like uh, you know, Snickers. inflation yeah, and Snickers, Snickers. Bars, yeah. I'm not getting enough cookies, you yeah. know, but, <laughs> but we know the real answer to yep. all of these problems is Bidenomics. Everyone else knows. Yeah. You've got Bobby Casey trying to, you know, get out of taking blame for voting for every Biden spending bill that yep. drove up Biden inflation. Shout out Dave McCormick in Pennsylvania, one of our best Senate recruits. Let's all hope that he can take out the worst empty suit in the Senate right now. Bobby Casey and his shrinkflation nonsense. Yeah. But 
for now, Bidenflation.com is awesome. Or Bidenomics.com, sorry. Bidenomics.com. And, and Akash brought us this great uh, Narragansett sh- uh, Shandy, uh, which I'm now drinking. And, you know, the easiest way to be our friend is to bring us tribute. <laughs> and I, I really appreciate that. Fellas, I think we did it. Absolute banger of an episode. Gentlemen, thanks so much, Whitlock, for standing in for Ashbrook, who never shows up when he's needed. <laughs> A pleasure. And, and thank you so much, Akash. Remember, folks, Bidenomics.com. So until next time, minions, keep the faith, hold the line, and own the libs. We'll see you on Thursday. Stay ruthless.